All right, can you hear me? Awesome, great. Well, thank you, Yusuf. Uh, so, yes, my name is Jonathan Hamash. Um, I'm a medical physics specialist and a PhD candidate. Uh, and today I'm going to be um, talking to you about radiation therapy and uh, first of all, beam shaping, uh, then patient flow or, or workflow in, in the department and uh, quality assurance. Uh, so I'm going to be spending most of my time on workflow, uh, but it'll be in three sections. I uh, just want to thank the people who provided slides or images for this work. So uh, this presentation, so Trang and Yusuf from ImageX, Craig from Royal North Shore Hospital and the Arsenic uh, entrance. Um, that's, a, that's an image uh, photography um, competition that ACPSEM runs every year. And there's some pictures from them in this. So uh, to start with, a very quick reintroduction to radi ther radiation therapy. Uh, thank you to Paul for covering this in the first uh, thing, but I'm just gonna go over it a bit, bit more. So what is radiation therapy? Uh, it's a treatment of, of cancer um, in, in partnership with medical oncology, uh, which is chemotherapy, using drugs or, or chemicals to, to, to kill the, the cancer cells. Surgical oncology, uh, which is cutting it out. And then, and we use radiation to treat these, these cancers, which are typically solid. Um, approximately 50% of cancer patients benefit from the use of, of radiation. So what, what are our modalities? Uh, the majority of our patients are treated with megavoltage x-rays, uh, but we also treat with high energy electrons, uh, superficial orthovoltage, which is a KV energy x-rays, brachytherapy, which is source, um, physical seeds uh, of radioactive um, material that are inserted into patients, and then a small proportion uh, protons and heavy ions, which we won't be covering. So superficial orthovoltage, this is very, uh, superficial um, skin uh, depth uh, treatments. So here we have a uh, scalp. Uh, this is a, a mouth um, ulcer. Uh, this is the machine. So it looks very much like a, 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 uh, an imaging x-ray system. It's just uh, outputs are much higher, much uh, uh, longer length of, of, of beam. Uh, and this is a, a, a setup of that. Uh, this is a, a linear accelerator bunker. So this is a linear accelerator. Um, or a LINAC, and this is the treatment couch. And so this is where a, a patient would be treated with using uh, mega voltage x-rays or electrons. And the difference between x-rays and electrons in, in, with treatment is the applicator for, um, the use of applicator for electrons, which isn't used for x-rays apart from the, the uh, molecule, the, the um, x-rays versus electrons. Brachytherapy, it's implantation of a, of a seed, either temporarily or permanent. And so um, just, just to let you know, these, uh, this exists. Okay, beam shaping. So that was a very quick introduction. Now I'm gonna be talking about beam shaping. Last week, Brendan gave us a really good introduction into how the electrons are accelerated. So from this part to this part. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about this section. Now, this is for an, this is a uh, a diagram of an elector machine. I'm going to be talking about a varying machine, but at a at a fundamental level, they're very very similar. Um, the images are all courtesy of Christchurch Hospital uh, in New Zealand. So, this is a cutaway of a linac linear accelerator. Uh, here we've got the electron gun. We've got the accelerating tube. Uh, we've got an energy switch, which, which uh, turns the machine from a 6 MV to an 8 MV machine, MV megavoltage. Uh, we have a, um, uh, the bending magnet here. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a target in here, primary collimator, flattening filter, iron chambers, and collimators. Uh, so that's, the, that's a big overview. And so last week, Brendan covered this section here. So for beam shaping, we have the major components. Are once we've left the, the accelerator tube, we go into a, a beam, a bending magnet, which turns the electron, the, yeah, the electrons at this point from horizontal to vertical. 
in we here we have a target we have a primary collimator which does the initial shaping flattening filters iron chamber and then collimators and then below that we go into the patient so this is a close-up of a target this is an actual target taken from a, a varian uh, linac uh, um, uh, and pictures of it so we have we have two different targets we have a, a high energy and a low energy so this was an 18 mv and a 6 mv target uh, the 6 mv is a lot thinner than the 18 these pipes are for active water cooling and this little spot in here so that's actually pitting of the target uh, so this machine was uh, decommissioned we removed the target and had a look inside it and there's a little bit of pitting in there and um, that's because the electron uh, beam on the target was too finely focused and basically wore away at the uh, at this at the target material. So now after we go from the target, which is in here, we go into the primary collimator, which which does the the, the initial collimation and and constrainment of the uh, X rays as they come out, uh, and this is the the bending magnet is is the what directs them from the, the linear, linear, linear accelerator tube onto that target and that uh, primary collimator. And the, the bending magnet's purpose is to um, focus and to uh, select the energy, um, maintain the energy. So once, the, once we're out of the, the, the primary collimator, it interacts with the flattening filters. So the purpose of these flattening filters is to uh, flatten the beam okay so when it comes out of uh out of the primary collimator before it's flattened it's got this forward peaked intensity so if you think this is, this is a cross profile this is a profile across the beam so it's centered so that the intensity is is uh, strongest in in the middle and, and it dips off the purpose of these flattening filters is to uh, remove that central intensity and keep it uniform or as uniform as possible across the, the, the field. So we've got, uh, it's, it's unique for each energy. So this is a, a 6 MV and an 18 MV. And if you had a 10 MV, you'd have a different one again. Uh, so once you've gone through the flattening filter or not, uh, in the case of flattening filter three uh, beams, we go through the iron chamber, which is here. So it comes through the flattening filters and interacts with the iron chamber. And the iron chamber is actually two iron, two um, separate iron chambers uh, um, sandwiched uh, on one on top of the other, and they are used to monitor the both the output of the beam, but also the position of the beam uh, laterally and longitudinally, and then that feeds back into uh, the, the positional system of the, the beam, as well as controlling how much. Uh, to controlling the, the stopping of the of the uh, the radiation. After we go through the iron chamber, we then it, the beam then interacts with the collimators. So first up, we have the upper collimator, uh, yeah, upper collimators and lower, and then in a very machine, the tertiary, which is the uh, the MLC. In an elector machine, to, um, you may have the the lower replaced with the MLCs. Uh, so in again, in a, a varying machine, the top jaws will be the Y jaws and the lower jaws will be the X jaws. So lateral uh, longitudinal. And these are used to the solid collimators, upper ones are used to uh, shape the beam into a square and the MLC is used to shape it into, um, into other shapes. Uh, so it's a, um, it's it's used us uh, uh, greatly within many of the modern treatment techniques, uh, such as IMRT intensity modulated radiation therapy, and uh, volumetric modulated arc therapy, so BMAT and IMRT, because we can shape the beam and they can move during treatment. So it's it's pairs of a high a high atomic number of metal that are individually controlled. And so this is a yeah, this is a video of um, there we go, of the leaves moving. So this is for a, this is for a, uh, an IMRT field. So the gantry is not moving. 
and you can see the MLC is, is going across the field and the field is the yellow. So it's, all right. So that was, that's beam shaping. Now, do I have any questions uh, from people about beam shaping? So I'm moving through this quickly because I've got lots of slides. Hey, Jonathan, could you quickly explain the, how the two iron chambers, so how from two iron chambers you can monitor the beam position? Not quickly. Uh, you've got, okay. you've got, you've got, <laughs> got D-electrodes in there. Uh, if I flick back uh, to it, um, you might be able to see closely in this, you've got uh, this, it, it's a two halves. Uh, so this one, you can see the D is there and the other half is a D there. Um, and that is, detects the, uh, that's, in this case, it would be the, the, the longitudinal. Uh, and in the, I think it's the other half, you have the Ds rotated 90 degrees. So you, you're you um, detecting the motion in the other, in the other plane, other, other uh, transverse plane. And it's a differential, uh, differential of the two of those with a with a zero so um yeah there's papers there's some really good papers out there I, I probably have them if you want to know more hit me up afterwards with an email um any other yeah, yeah so um if if we see that the beam position is not correct from those two chambers what is done then like so that's all that's con all controlled digitally or within the the linux system Mm -hmm. So um, on a normal treatment, that is, it's not, that shows that that can be seen, but on a normal treatment is not monitored. Uh, physics does QA on the beam shape on mm -hmm. a routine basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and when the machine is commissioned or when it is um, on an annual basis or when needed, uh, that, that shape is controlled that the left right in out uh, position yep. is controlled and then mm -hmm. that is set as the reference and so the machine always drives to that reference right Thanks. all right uh i'll keep going uh for time if you have any questions throw them in the chat or ask them at the end so workflow so what i'm talking about here is the the patient flow from diagnosis to treatment uh, and focusing uh, on the, the patient and, and their experience of the system. Um, so first up, who works in radiotherapy? So you've got four staff groupings. You've got your radiation oncologists. So they're your, your specialist doctors, your radiation therapists who uh, do a lot of the hands-on work with the the face-to-face the, 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 the -face work with the patients on a daily day-to-day -day basis uh, and do a lot of the the heavy lifting within the department on, uh, from a in terms of a, a patient um, uh, perspective you've got the medical physicists uh, like myself who are much more in the in the background uh, but also if, uh, are important within the department for the the flu smooth run of the department and whose responsibility is a lot of the, uh, the computer systems and the, the machines and making sure everything is running safely and we are delivering um, and helping to deliver quality treatment. And then you've got the nurses who deliver the, uh, any of the nursing uh, wound care, skin care, uh, things um, that uh, the patients may um, have. So this is the overall uh, flow of a patient through the department. So we start with the diagnosis. So typically the patient has a diagnosis of, of cancer and then they come in to uh, the radiotherapy department. They, get, they go into planning, uh, which is this, this red section. Then they go into treatment delivery. During treatment, there is a review, uh, sometimes weekly, uh, sometimes daily, uh, and depending on what that review shows up, they may need to go back and get replanned. Uh, but and once treatment is completed, uh, that that's that's it. Um, so uh, radiotherapy treatments are typically delivered on a daily basis over a number of of weeks, 
so for example, a prostate treatment is 80 gray, uh, around 80 gray in, in approximately 40 fractions uh, standard. And so that's an eight week uh, treatment course, five days, five work days, and then uh, uh, no treatment on the weekend. And another example would be a, a breast treatment, which um, is now uh, about uh, 40 gray in 15 fractions approximately. And so that would be a three week uh, treatment process. So diagnosis, uh, the two most commonly treated sites in radiation therapy are breast and uh, prostate or gastrourinary. And then we've got brain, head and neck, which is uh, anything from a kind of here up to below the brain. Um, uh, gastrointestinal, which is uh, your uh, digestive tract, lung, gynecological, uh, palliative is, is a catch-all for anything that we're not planning. We, we, the treatment isn't aimed to cure. It's for um, symptom relief or, or the like. Uh, so how do we diagnose? Commonly, um, we, we stage. So you might've heard of, of cancer staging. One example of that is the uh, tumor nodes metastasis uh, system, TMN, and TNM, sorry. And so uh, example for lung cancer is you have a tumor size. So depending on the size, you get a T score. Depending on, on the lymph node involvement, so from none through to uh, widespread lymph node involvement, you get an N score. And then you get a metastasis score of, of not existing or existing. And so the, the higher the number, typically the worse it is. And then these are grouped into four stages. Stage one being the, uh, the, the lowest stage, stage four being the, the, the worst stage. So typically your best treatment outcomes are when you have a low stage. And so this is dependent on, this is unique for each treatment, uh, each um, uh, site, diagnosis site. And depending on the stage will depend on how they're treated. So it's, it's uh, quite commonly a multidisciplinary discussion between surgery, uh, the surgical oncology and medical oncology in term, and radiation oncology in terms of how to uh, effectively treat uh, the patient. So once they've... Uh, once it's been said, yes, they're coming to radiation oncology and they're, they're going to get a radiation therapy uh, treatment, they come and they are booked in for a, a simulation CT or a planning CT. Uh, so that is this section. And any other imaging on the side, so that could be an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, or a PET, um, which is a nuclear medicine a scan. So with the planning CT, we are simulating their treatment. Uh, so we set them up exactly as they would be for treatment. And we take a CT scan of that setup uh, so that we can create a, an, a radiation therapy treatment plan using that. And we know how they're going to be set up when they go uh, to treatment. So at the top here, this is an old style simulator. So it's a planar um, simulator. Uh, you would be very lucky to find or unlucky to find one of those in a, in a uh, department these days. More commonly, you'll find a, a CT scan or you'll almost certainly find a CT scan in a radiation therapy department. And we're moving into the realm of, of MRI simulators uh, as we, uh, because of their improved soft tissue imaging quality and the uh, introduction of MR Linux so a LINAC combined with a magnetic resonance imaging system. So while the patient is in simulation, they get the tattoos, they get their, um, their uh, setup done, um, corrected, and we, we write that down, record that, so that, again, it can be uh, set up exactly the same at uh, treatment. So down here, this is a... Um, uh, and mobilization system. So uh, these are masks or uh, thermoplastic masks. So you bathe them in, in hot, uh, hot water and they become elastic. You form them over the patient and they harden uh, with, 
uh, when, as they cool down. So they are used to immobilize and, and restrain the patient to prevent them from moving. Uh, this here uh, and, and here are examples of 4D CTs. So a, a CT that moves or that uh, uh, shows that a time or the breathing cycle. So typically used for lung or abdominal cancers where there is breathing motion involved. And we wanna see where, how the tumor moves while uh, the breathing is going on. And up here we have uh, the CT scan and then a J, um, associated imaging. So uh, we have an MR overlaid on that CT and we have a PET. And each of those have their have benefits in terms of imaging to show uh, either the uh, metabolic uh, extent of the cancer, the soft tissue extent, or the, the bony. And uh, the, this, the CT is what we use to plan and to uh, calculate dose with. So what is a 4D CT? As I said, it's a, it's a time series uh, CT, and it shows the, the, the breathing, the motion with, of, during breathing. So we take a CT, uh, a, a longer CT, and we split it into each, two, uh, 10 phases. Typically it's 10 phases across the breathing cycle and bend the images. So we, get up, we end up with, with 10, CT scans and they show us how the tumor moves during, during breathing. Once we have the sim, simulation images, uh, the planning CT, we then move on to contouring. So target volume and organ at risk uh, delineation. So we have uh, the target. So this is, is what we wanna hit. Uh, the target is broken down into two, um, uh, well, three volumes. So the first one is the, the gross tumor volume. So that's the actual tumor that you can see. So in this case, the, the red. You have a CTV, which is the actual tumor, so the GTV, plus a, uh, a um, well, fairly well, a, 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 a expansion that is defined in literature typically. Now that may or may not be, be used in all situations. Um, and then we've got the PTV. So in this situation, it's the, the green one, and that's the, the planning target volume being the, the CTV, the clinical target volume, plus margins to account for day-to-day -day setup changes, um, potential um, inaccuracies in, in treatment delivery. And so that's a, that's a uh, margin so that we are ensuring that the full dose is delivered to the actual uh, CTV. So this is in visual in, in visual form. We have a, a, a GTV in the center, a clinical target volume, a CTV, a PTV, which covers the, um, the potential. In this case, it would be for a, a lung where we think the tumor might move in that volume. Um, now, typically this is an older, diagram. So typically the treated volume will actually uh, be closer to the, the PTV uh, and the radiated volume won't be quite so big, but this is more for an older style treatment where we're treating a box. And once, once we've got the target, we then contour the organs at risk. So these are the, the organs surrounding our target that are of critical importance. So we want to limit the, the radiation dose to so in the head and neck region, it might be the parotids, for example, the eyes, brainstem. Uh, we want to be careful of the femoral heads because they are uh, used the um, bone marrow uh, sites there. So we don't want to over irradiate them. And, but what we contour depends on the site. So in the lung, you'll contour the heart, esophagus, spinal cord. In the brain, it'll be, or brain or head and neck region, it'll be the the organs are around that area. And so we contour them and, and uh, dose limits, radiation dose limits are set uh, for them by the doctor. So once we have our, our volumes, we then move on to uh, radiation planning. In this case, it's called dose planning, but um, it, it's, yep. So the process of this is so we've got our planning CT, discuss that, we've got our contours. So once we've got those two, the radiation oncologist will prescribe the treatment. And that is, they will uh, indicate 
the total dose and the number of fractions uh, used to treat used to tr uh, the target. And they'll also indicate what, uh, what they want to limit the uh, organs at risk to. Then a radiation therapist will take, the, uh, take that prescription, apply some fields to the patient and on using the CT scan, and then optimize that, those placements of those fields or the technique, um, or many other methods of optimization to uh, get a, 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 an appropriate treatment for the patient that meets the, the radiation oncologist's prescription or uh, gets as close to it as possible. The dose is calculated uh, and that, that dose calculation, radiation planning and dose calculation could be a whole lecture of their own. So I'm not gonna be going into them except to, to mention that, that it happens. Then the, the plan, once a, a, a appropriate plan is, is uh, is um, generated, uh, it'll, be, it'll be checked uh, first by the planner and then by a, generally by a second radiation therapist and run past the radiation oncologist. Once everyone's happy with the plan, uh, it is approved. And at that point, it can't be, can't be changed. It's locked uh, digitally. Uh, and once, once it's been approved, it moves through a series of checks uh, performed by radiation therapists and or physicists Generally, these are termed quality assurance, uh, patient-specific quality assurance, and that's to check that the the, the plan is is suitable. Uh, there's nothing uh, uh, concerning or that's going to go wrong with its treatment. And this is it's a, it's a, it's to ensure the quality of the patient treatment, and that we're doing uh, that we've done the planning correctly and the dose calculation. Once once uh, QA has been performed. It then is passed sent to the treatment unit and they do a, a final preparation before uh, treating the patient. So what decisions are a part of this the treatment planning? And this is back at the, the, uh, the prescription point. So are we treating to cure or are we treating to, to for symptoms? Uh, what technique is gonna be used? Uh, and the next few slides will go through some of those techniques and some of the options uh, we have for that. And then, Total dose, uh, the dose per fraction. So, are we doing standard dose or um, high dose per fraction? So, which would be, which could be a stereotactic. Uh, and then, how close is it to critical organs? So, um, what uh, do we need to, uh, for stereotactic, we need to, we typically need to um, either bolt the patient to the, to the couch or uh, make sure they don't move at all because uh, we have a, for some of these treatments, we have a, uh, a half a mil tolerance on, on, on movement, uh, whereas other, other treatments, we don't have to be quite so, um, quite so restrictive on our, on our movements. So how, how can we treat them? So uh, this is an example of a single posterior field. This would typically be used for, um, for treating uh, a spine and uh, for, um, for palliative treatments. And so we have in this image, we got the, our, our field here. We have our OARs indicated uh, kidney organs at risks indicated by the, the blue and the, the green. Uh, we have a scale showing uh, percentages. Uh, and I don't know what the prescription is, but these are quite commonly single posterior fields are very commonly eight gray in a single fraction. And this one is using MLC sh uh, shaping uh, to constrain the field. Uh, this is an example of a, of a breast uh, treatment. So this is an older style uh, treatment, which is still commonly used, uh, but it's a simple two field tangents. We have fields coming in here and here, and they, uh, they're tangential to the chest wall. And the idea of this is to minimize dose as, mi as much as possible to the lung while maintaining full dose to the, to the target, which in this case is the breast. And so we have, uh, in this image, we have an isocenter, we have a image center, we have uh, our target PTV in red, our fields, and these are fields using wedges instead um, with no MLC shape shielding. 
This is a uh, more recent uh, or a, a up and coming breast treatment techniques, uh, uh, volumetric modulated arc therapy, BMAT uh, and IMRT. And these use the MLC to shape, uh, dynamically shape the field. And the low dose in this, scent, in this case is 40 gray and the maximum dose, which is red is about uh, uh, 55, 54, 55 gray. And the big difference between these techniques and the, the tangential treatment is the low dose wash, which isn't shown in this, in this image, but is shown in this image. So you can see there's very little low dose wash into the lung, where in, in both these cases, the low dose wash would be a lot uh, greater into the lung. So this is an example of a pelvis four field box. Uh, so this is, this is treating, um, uh, for example, say a gynecological or a rectal cancer. Um, uh, and they can sometimes be used for short treatment courses, but typically aren't used anymore. In, um, instead, we would, we would use uh, BMAT to, to treat these, um, but it's a four field box because your treatment area, your treatment dose is a box effectively. You get that's your 95 approximately would be that box. There's another older, more historic method, a six field conformal plan. And that's more conformal to, in this case, the prostate, but it's still not uh, immensely uh, conformal, especially when you compare it to the, uh, the modern techniques of, of uh, VMAT and IMRT. And you can see that these are the red, which is or, well, treatment. Uh, the, the treatment would be the somewhere between the, the 90 and 100. Um, but you can see that they are wrapping very closely around the, the target, which is in red. And this is an example of uh, head and neck VMAT treatments with different field arrangements. Uh, but we're, uh, our, the idea with, with these treatments is to make the, the dose as conformal as possible. But this is a, I think it's a five field IMRT. We have a, uh, these, these two are both full arc. Uh, VMATs, and then we've got two partial arc uh, VMAT treatments. And the difference you can see between them is the extent of the low dose and the conformality over the target. Uh, so the high dose in this case is uh, the green and low dose is, so dark green is, is high dose and uh, light green is, sorry, dark green is high dose, light green is low dose. So once we've got a treatment plan, we move on to treatment delivery. So this is where the, uh, the, the, the plan is, is uh, delivered onto the patient. So this is another uh, view of a, of a treatment bunker. This time we've got a patient on the bed. Uh, we have our therapists setting up the patient here, our linear accelerator with a KV imaging system off uh, um, perpendicular to the main beam line. This also has a, a stereotactic imaging system. So this panel here pairs with this source and this source back here pairs with this panel here. And they are used for um, imaging the patient uh, during treatment. Uh, it's a, uh, a third party system. So hopefully this video will work. Okay. This is a patient example, uh, example of a patient treatment, uh, head and neck. And you can see this, this guy has been setting up for treatment. Uh, this is the imaging component where he's getting scanned probably with a comb beam CT. Uh, he's getting receiving brain treatment. Uh, you can tell that because the, the lasers are focused on his brain. He's, using, he's wearing a mask that only goes down to uh, upper neck. And so you've got the therapist. This is part of the setup where they're setting up the patient and imaging. So he's getting a vertex arc, which goes um, around along the top of his, of his field. 
then this mask, many people would tell you, is uh, very difficult uh, to handle for some patients, uh, which is why some of our researchers are, are looking at whether we can uh, treat without it. Uh, I'm going to keep moving in, in the interest of time. All right. So treatment de delivery, what happens? Patients are uh, first brought into the room. So they're, 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 they're brought in, um, they're asked, uh, what's your name, date of birth? So they're identified positively as the, as the person for whom the treatment plan is, uh, has been made. Uh, they then are set up on the couch according to how they were set up at simulation using the marks, uh, using the, um, might be uh, the, the, the mask, the tattoos or any other uh, system that is used to set up and align the patient. The RTs leave the room so that only the patient is left in the room. Uh, images that are then acquired uh, to um, locate the patient uh, uh, radio radiographically. That might be a 2D image, which is the, the main beam line or a KV, or it could be in 3D using cone beam CT. These images are then uh, compared with the planning images and the patient shifted to so that they are in the exact same or as close to the same position at treatment as they were at simulation. And then the treatment beams are delivered. So imaging, uh, this is an example of uh, KV X-ray images. Uh, this is looking at bony anatomy in this case. Uh, and this one is looking at fiducial markers that would be in this case implanted in the prostate. Uh, and so in this case, you're a lot, you'd be aligning the, the bony anatomy uh, acquired on the day to the uh, bony anatomy of the CT scan. And in this case, you, you're matching the position of the fiducials acquired on the day to the uh, fiducials as they were at uh, simulation. Uh, and, oh, uh, this video is not gonna work, I don't think. All right, this beam was meant, this video was meant to show the comb beam process, but it's not going to work for me. So I'll skip that. All right, so comb beam CT, it is a, uh, a form of CT uh, made using the, uh, using a, a cone. So using the KV system uh, set that's per, most commonly perpendicular to the main beam line. And that's, uh, that's, the image we get out from the from a cone beam, and that is a standard CT there. So you can see there is contrast and, and imaging differences between the two. You can also see that there are differences in, in the patient anatomy. So this is why when we do, we use this 3D imaging because it shows us uh, in, internal differences and changes uh, that have occurred. Uh, and so this is a, uh, a, a matching of the images. Uh, to get us our, our final treatment location. That's when we, we shift the patient. And why, but if you look at this, this sequence of images, uh, it's counting down from, so this is fraction 23, and it counts down to fraction zero. And you can see the daily changes that occur throughout treatment, uh, whether the patient is, is slightly left or right, the hips are in different positions, there's different rectal feeling, different bladder feeling, which, shifts the position of the prostate. And so this is what we are correcting for on a daily basis when we do the, the cone beam images. So that's treatment delivery. And once during treatment delivery, we also will do a process of, um, of assessment of the plan and how it's going. So do we have any questions about uh, treatment delivery? And, oh, sorry, about patient flow through the treatment, uh, the department. Uh, no questions. All right, well, I will keep moving. Um, I'll, there'll be a time to ask questions at the end as well, if, uh, if you think of any in the meantime. All right, quality assurance. Uh, so uh, what is quality assurance? 
according to ISO 9000, uh, which is a reference document um, uh, and has, oh, this is from version 1994 and there's uh, newer versions as well, but this, this definition still applies today. It is all the planned and systemic actions necessary to provide adequate confidence that a product or service will satisfy the given requirements for quality. So in radiation therapy, that is everything is involved in making sure that our, our uh, service, which is the patient treatment, is both safe and effective, has high quality. And that involves um, all the, the components from, from beginning, uh, from, from, from beginning of the patient entry to exit and everything the patient sees and does not see. So it's, it's measuring performance uh, of say the linear accelerator and comparing against uh, standard fields. It, um, it could be looking at the quality of patient. So for the patient specific uh, quality assurance, looking at the patient plan and comparing it against uh, previous plans to make sure that where our quality hasn't changed or that the, the, the plan is of equivalent quality what we've done in the past. A lot of the software we use have settings and those settings can impact the uh, output of the software system. So we need to confirm that we have the correct uh, settings and that they haven't changed on a, on a routine basis. It could be routine, could be up to 12 months. Anything, any, any activity or component that is part of ensuring we have a, a, a constantly of delivered dose uh, so that um, our, our treatment, our measured unit, we know what our, 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 our one delivery unit is. So uh, we will typically talk in terms of monitor units on a, um, on a radiation therapy plan. And we know a monitor unit is one centigrade uh, under very specific reference conditions. And the treatment planning system uh, is able to convert that in for each patient, but we need to measure that and confirm that on a, on a regular basis that that one MU is one centigrade in, under those conditions. And it's also any part of, of ensuring safe and effective treatment. So why? why, why do we want to do, why do we need to perform uh, quality assurance? Well, we don't want errors to occur. We don't want, we don't want um, things to slip, to, to slip into what we do that could lead to a, a patient harm or an error or something going wrong. Uh, so this was a, an, artic an article in 2010, came out in the New York Times, which detailed a number of fairly horrific incidents or accidents uh, in which uh, patients if, uh, were overdosed due to errors in radiotherapy. And uh, if you look at the, uh, there's reports online, uh, you can search this on the internet and you should be able to get an open access article of that if you would like to read it. But it goes into details as to why it is into the, the process of, of how that error occurred. And you'll see that it's not just one thing that went wrong, it's, it's a number of things. So this uh, image here is a, is a representation of, of one uh, theoretical uh, accident process. So this is a Swiss cheese model. And each of, those, each of these uh, disks is effectively a, a slice of, of Swiss cheese. And then, um, which is a, a, a section. So we've got a consultation or diagnosis, planning, uh, contouring, prescription, and within that, there are holes in which an errors could occur. And so the idea is that we have enough of these procedures and processes in place to catch any errors. Uh, and we don't want them lining up so that we get all the way to the end and, and we cause there's an, there's an, an error. Uh, and so these are examples of um, inter interventions or quality assurance actions that we can take that can potentially prevent um, uh, errors down at this end, but there are also things that we can do at this end to, to try and do that. But also we, we want to ensure that the quality of our treatment. Uh, and so this, uh, this is an ex example of the therapeutic window. So we want to push the tumor, uh, tumor dose high 
while keeping normal, normal tissue dose low. And in, in doing that, if we can widen that gap, then we can push the tumor dose higher uh, and keep the, the, the uh, patient experience the same. Or if we're a high enough dose already, we can reduce the, the burden on the patient. And so their side effects and, and the like are lesser. So this is, uh, this is one example of, of when we talk about, about quality is, is making sure that we have a sharp fall off of dose uh, that we're treating the tumor and not the normal tissue, uh, that we're not causing side effects for the patient. Uh, um, now there are always, it is radiation and we're treating through the patient. So there's, there's always going to be effects, but we'd want to minimize them as much as possible. Uh, so what does quality assurance look like? Uh, this is a fairly extreme version of quality assurance. And this is a, uh, I believe that they are replacing a, uh, the beam shaping components, what we talked about in the first half, they're entirely replacing that. So following this, this uh, intervention here, um, later, this, is, this is a lot of work for the physicists after this. You've removed shielding, so you need to make sure the shielding goes back on. You've got to recommission the beam line uh, check your, your radiation output, your field shaping. Um, so uh, the Chen Zhuming's question earlier about lateral longitudinal position, that has to be, that would all have to be redone after a change of this magnitude. And so we, most commonly it's, uh, for, the, for the physicists, it is uh, when, when an event occurs, making sure that, uh, that things work, that the systems and processes are working correctly after those, after, after something has occurred. But we also do routine maintenance and routine quality assurance to ensure that uh, the, the machine and the, the, our treatments are where we expect them to be. And that, that could be both in the, the delivery, but, but also could, can be in the IT systems and the, the planning systems or the contouring the imaging, so the CT scan are used in simulation. Uh, these are all things that, that we need to uh, work with and work on uh, to ensure the, the, that we are maintaining the quality of our treatment. So what should be included in quality assurance? Everything, <laughs> or every, every, every system or piece of equipment uh, that's involved in patient treatment and sometimes that is used in our uh, in our quality assurance, so that uh, the, the the what we're using to measure isn't degrading. And so, if if what we're using to measure degrades, then our treatment our, our measurement quality is degrading. We may be missing missing things. So I could keep going on and on. I'm not going to uh, because it's uh, ten to four. Um, QA is the subject of my PhD, so. Uh, it's, it's something that I am, I'm interested in and you could even say passionate about. So if you want more information on QA, there's ideas there. I would say speak to your local physicists, but um, yeah. And thank you. Do we have any questions at all? Thanks, Jonathan, for your talk. Sorry if I rushed through it. Um, no, all good. Um, I did have one question, which is, you mentioned how, um, you know, you had that slide where with the bladder filling uh, at different days of treatment. Yep. And we do account for the prostate position throughout treatment, but do we account for a change of depth? Like if the bladder is in between the prostate and treatment beam, say, and it adds an extra five millimeter, does that mean that like all of a sudden we're missing five millimeter of the prostate. Like, is there any accounting for a change of depth uh, in treatment? Because you can see like the patient contour vary day to day. Um, so you're talking so, about the yes. position of the prostate on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so, so, so that's accounted for by um, like doing a template matching, like, yeah. uh, but if the amount of tissue between the outside of the body and the prostate changes, that would change the dose. 
yeah so um, is that accounted for like do we do an adjustment for that not in not typically in radiation in in, in uh, prostate um because you don't generally get patients putting on substantial amounts of weight mm -hmm. uh uh you you typically need multiple centimeters of, of excess extra tissue or loss of tissue um to have seen impact on the the dose to the target where you're most likely to see this is for uh head and neck uh targets so for example if we took this this imrt treatment here and instead of the the skin being where it is now if say this patient put on a uh, started retaining um uh liquid uh there and and that bulged out then that would substantially change that the dose to the target uh conversely if you start with a very bulgy uh tumor and that shrinks that will also change uh that asymmetry and so in those cases it's typically you it the idea would be uh the patient is reviewed and the appropriateness of the plan is, is assessed. And if, if it's not delivering the dose correctly, uh, you pause if needed. Um, typically we, we try not to pause because that has its own problems, uh, but we replan as quick as possible and, and get a new plan if, if it's not appropriate. Cool. Um, James asked a question, does the PTV change with tumor response to radiotherapy? Typically, we do not change the PTV during treatment, typically. Uh, again, in the situation for, say, a shrinking head and neck tumor, where we replan, we may redo the target. But for the majority of treatment sites, if the tumor shrinks, we don't shrink the margins. We, we keep treating the same volume. Uh, traditional, that's traditional um, uh, for, for, treat, for treatments like adaptive, that's a different story, but I won't go into that to complicate things. Basically, no, we don't, we don't generally change the target volume. Um, I have a bit of a, weird question uh, mm -hmm. regarding QA. Mm -hmm. um, so I know like a lot of radiation incidents were found by looking at patients' response and seeing that yeah. like they're doing significantly worse than side effects. Uh, yeah. Yeah, than what you would expect. Um, do we have, do you know if it's a standard uh, program in radiation centers to have somebody evaluate that or is when they find it it's just like a result of somebody doing a research project and... uh, no there there is um these patients get routine follow-up so mm -hmm. um so they'll, they'll come for the treatments and then they will get followed up by their doctors uh or th they will be with under the doc they're they're prescribing oncologists care mm -hmm. for potentially years afterwards getting assessed. I think initially it's a three month, it's every, it's, it's say three months, six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 and, and so on. And so there is regular assessment of these patients and their side effects. Uh, so the acute side effects of those which are, um, which are identified during treatment or very shortly afterwards mm -hmm. and then you've got long-term side effects uh, which are those that are typically seen three six twelve months afterwards and the acute ones will typically resolve and there won't be any long-term effects but sometimes they will become long long-term uh, side effects and long-term side effects generally don't get resolved so they will impact the patient on an ongoing basis so it is something that we that is monitored closely uh, should yeah should be and generally is monitored closely by the doctors so they, they look at like cohort data so like for example if you know one doctor or one machine has lung patients have 10 percent more radiation pneumonitis than another machine in the same center um like 
that's the type of thing that has ha like that has uh, led to some mistake being identified. Um, yes, but so that would be routine or no, like uh, analysis of. Um, I, I, um, I can't talk. I can't talk specifically if they do that. I, I haven't. Okay. I haven't seen it done. Uh, okay. um, but I believe that yes, there is there are processes in place to try and identify where um, more uh, worst reactions are are effect, in, impacted, and and so you have there. There's a certain level of reporting of side effects, and there's grades of side effects from from one, which is the least, through to well, five is death. So four t technically, mm -hmm. um, and so you got these these grades, and so anything over a certain grade, you actually have to report and they right. keep track of. All so right. yes, that is that is done as a route on a routine basis. All right. Um, so it's three fifty eight. Um, if nobody else has any question, I have one last question. Oh, somebody okay. raised their hand. Uh, please go ahead and ask a question if you have some. Hello, I'm Kashif here. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to ask you this question. Um, I am planning uh, some uh, equipment. Mm, for example, I uh, I am thinking about a linear accelerator and a CT simulator for my department. Um, I am trying to think about uh, identify or vision RT and its connection with the uh, CT simulator. Do I need to purchase a 4D CT simulator uh, with, with the vision RT? Or you, do you'd you have think... to talk with the vendors of that. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. not something that I can, I can really answer or speak to, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. having not had any experience, not having very minimal experience with either of those, and it'd be a situational thing for you. So uh, yeah, my, my, talk, to you, talk to the vendors, talk to your representatives. All right. So okay, thank you. You said, did you have one more question? Um, sure. I was going to ask you, um, in terms of QA uh, or things that come up with QA, how many is dissymmetric issues and how many are geometric issues? In terms, sorry, like, like when you find something like when QA comes up with something that requires you to change it. Uh, say, for example, like. Uh, so, so, how often does a patient plan need to be replanned? Uh, I'm talking more about machine QA than uh, patient specific QA. Um, Very well, in my experience, and I'm talking personal, personally, uh, what I've seen, uh, it's you, you, you have to recal say, recalibrate the output. You need to check it on a yearly basis and you generally correct it on a yearly basis. Right. Uh, the jaws, for example, go out of calibration as well. And so you have to correct them. Um, it's about equal. Uh, yeah, we, we probably can, we, we can have a, a, a broader discussion offline, I think, because I think there's, there's more to, I can answer about the question, but not on this, uh, be more, more a personal discussion. So if anyone else, if anyone does have any more questions, uh, feel free to to email me, uh, and I'll I'll respond as as best I can, um, or try try and direct you on to someone who can if I'm not able to. All right, um, so that's it for this lecture. Um, thanks everyone for coming, and the next one will be same time next week. Um, thanks.